Welcome, everyone. My name is John McCord. I'm the Associate Director of Education and Outreach here at the Coastal Studies Institute, and I want to welcome you to another installment of Science on the Sound, our monthly lecture series focused on topics of concern to the residents of Northeastern North Carolina. We're really excited today to have Aaron Fleckenstein from the Coastal Federation here to give a talk on the North Carolina Oyster Blueprint. But before we do so, just a few housekeeping items. Um, our big open house that we host every year is coming up again on April 20th. We hope you come out, spend the day with us. It'll be from 11 to 3 p.m. on Saturday, April 20th. Um, faculty and staff will be full in the building, lots of family-friendly activities, meet folks, learn about research. Um, hopefully we'll have good weather, fingers crossed. It's hit and miss, as you know, in late April. Um, other things that are happening during that Earth Day week, on April 22nd, on actually on Earth Day, we'll be doing a film screening of Inundation, Inundation District and a panel discussion. This is a film on development in coastal communities, specifically in Boston. We're gonna have a panel discussion actually brought in, um, beamed in from ECU and some folks here on site as well. We're gonna take a break from Science on the Sound in April because of the open house and the film screening, but we'll be back in May um, and we'll resume in May with Climate Readiness is Key with Dr. Alex Hodges from the ECU College of Nursing. So climate readiness from a nursing perspective, I'm curious as to what that means and I can't wait to hear. We're really privileged to have Erin Fleckenstein with the Coastal Federation here to give her um, presentation on North Carolina's Oyster Blueprint and its success. And uh, a little bit about Erin before she gets started. Erin coordinates the statewide oyster blueprint for the North Carolina Coastal Federation. The blueprint is a strategic document that guides oyster restoration and protection measures in North Carolina. Implementing the blueprint involves working with three regional offices of the Federation while partnering with over 30 state and federal agencies, university and NGO partners, industry stakeholders, and fishers. The blueprint focuses on building our state's oyster resources through water quality protection, building new oyster habitats, growing the shellfish mariculture industry, sustaining wild harvest, and engaging the public in the work. I hope I didn't just blow your whole presentation in that yeah, one. Yeah, I mean, it's done. <laughs> Aaron holds a Master's of Science in Marine Biology from the University of North Carolina at Wilmington, my alma mater, and a Bachelor of Science in uh, Marine and Freshwater Biology from the University of New Hampshire. Prior to her current role with the Federation, Erin served as a coastal scientist for the Wanchi's office from 2008 to 2022, leading a variety of initiatives to restore wetlands, create oyster sanctuaries, and living shorelines and build rain gardens. She also served as the Wanchi's office regional manager for a decade from 2012 to 2022. So without further ado, Erin Fleckenstein. Thanks, John. Good evening, everyone. It's nice to see you all. Um, John, the intro was a nice preview of what you're going to hear, so at least you have a little background knowledge as we get into tonight's presentation. Um, so before I get too deep into the blueprint, I'm going to start with a little bit of background on the Coastal Federation for those of you that aren't familiar with us. We are a coastwide nonprofit organization working in all 20 counties, uh, 20 coastal counties of North Carolina's coastal. Um, environment. We work um, through our three offices. We have an office in Wrightsville Beach. Our headquarters is in the Moorhead City, New Newport area. And then our Outer Banks office is just down the street in Wanchies. There are 41 staff members um, throughout the organization. There's only five of us here on the Outer Banks, um, but we serve you proudly. Our current executive director is Braxton Davis. He's about a month and a half into the job. He's just assumed this role. Um, Todd Miller was our founder and executive director up until the beginning of, of February. So as an organization, we work on a number of coastal issues, um, six in particular, salt marsh restoration and preservation, water quality restoration and protection, ensuring good coastal management of our resources, environmental education, and marine debris removal and prevention. But what you guys came to talk about tonight or hear about tonight is oysters. So this is sort of the sixth program area and in my opinion, the most important that we'll be talking about tonight. Um, so what are oysters? Why do we care about oysters? What's the value and importance of oysters? Well, oysters are ecosystem engineers. And so what that means is they're not only an animal, right? But they are also creating their habitat. So they are creating oyster reefs. Um, you have oysters that 
land on top of each other and over time create these interdimensional restructures that then provide great habitat for other organisms, other fish um, and crustaceans, such as the blue crab here. They provide great habitat for um, red drum and the oyster catchers and, and other important coastal organisms here. In addition to the habitat that they create, they are filter feeders. So they're taking uh, plankton and sediments from the water, they're filtering them out, ensuring that the water is a little bit cleaner and clearer than it was when they got there. One oyster, one adult oyster, can filter up to 50 gallons of water in a day. So that's a significant um, value that each of those individual oysters are providing for our coastal environment. And then where they exist along shorelines, um, they can help to stabilize shorelines, right? They can help to dissipate the wave energy, um, slowing down erosion, and helping to stabilize our shorelines. So all of those reasons are, are environmental reasons why they're so valuable and important. In addition, oysters provide jobs um, from the growing and harvesting of oysters to things like what I do, helping to, to restore and manage oysters. So there's a number of employment opportunities related to oysters. Unfortunately, our global population of oysters and the population here in North Carolina is in decline. So this has come about from a variety of reasons, but most prevalently from historic overharvest. So in the 1800s and early 1900s, we really didn't have a lot of regulation around harvest, and so there was a lot of harvesting happening without putting material back into the water to help regrow our oyster reefs. As the coast has been developed, um, we've had a variety of habitat loss come into play. So as our landscape is modified, we have new roads and ditches and, and things coming on to, online that increases our sedimentation and burying of reefs um, and then coastal development, dredging and what have you can also impact the, the oyster habitat itself. So all of that then leads to decreases in water quality, which can of course contribute to the loss of oysters as well. So these are our three main reasons why we have lost oysters over time. And this, these next couple of slides, I think, are really interesting. Um, our, my partners over at Division of Marine Fisheries and NC State helped provide these. But um, this is an image that was created from survey data in the late 1800s and early 1900s of where oyster reefs were located and where they were being harvested in Pamlico Sound. So what you're looking at is a map of northeastern North Carolina, and all of these white areas are where historic oyster harvest was taking place. So you can see that it was concentrated in these mouths of the rivers where the Croatan and pa Pamlico Sound are coming together. Oh, I'm supposed to have a pointer here, right? Yeah. Um, and you know, along the Hyde County mainland here, um, down into uh, around Cedar Island and Core Sound and then up along the back side of the Outer Banks. Not a whole lot happening in the middle of the sound and I don't know if that is because they just weren't harvesting in the middle of the sound, it's deeper there, it may have been harder to harvest or if there really just weren't any oyster reefs in the middle. But this is the best data that we have about where oysters were occurring in the late 1800s, early 1900s. You flash forward a century and this is what our oyster reefs look like now. Um, so I'll go back to the 1900s to today, and you can see we've had significant loss of our oyster reefs in a lot of the locations where, um, where there was historic reef and harvest occurring. So all of this has led to some um, data being con d distributed right here. So we've seen about an 88% biomass reduction in our oysters in that 100-year that time frame. Um, which is causing 85% less filtration in our sounds, so less water is being filtered, and we have less harvest, less landings coming, so about 90% reduction in our harvest of oysters in that 100-year time span. So I think this quote is really important to point out to you in the top left corner. Oysters and oyster reefs are the most imperiled marine habitat on Earth. The most imperiled habitat on Earth, marine habitat on Earth. So really important that we protect and restore our oyster populations as we move forward. There have been a number of efforts to do so. Since the late 1900s, um, there have been a number of efforts, I'm sorry, early 1900s, there's been a number of efforts 
plans that have been developed, ideas that have been put forward to help build back our oyster resources. I'm not going to go through all of this. There's a lot of data, and we're, we're going to move through this pretty quickly here. But the thing that I want you to know is that there's been a lot of plans developed, and there were a lot of really great ideas that came out of those plans. And then the Coastal Federation, working with some of our other NGO partners and university partners, said, we're going to create a plan to end all plans. We are going to create the oyster blueprint, and we are going to take ideas from all of these plans that are cross-cutting and help to sort of break down silos between just focusing on water quality, just focusing on the fisheries management side, just focusing on habitat, and try and come up with those cross-cutting recommendations. And so that's really what the Oyster Blueprint is trying to do, is to create a roadmap for protecting and restoring our oyster reefs, um, but taking ideas from all of these different sectors of habitat management, fisheries management, water quality protection, et cetera. So we've had three editions of the Blueprint um, starting back in 2003. We're currently in our fourth edition. So um, this is the, the current edition. It was released in April of 2021. And um, we wrote it during the pandemic, which was an adventure in and of itself. To, it was learning how to do Zoom meetings, trial by fire, and learning how to use the polling function to get people to vote on strategies and actions. It was, it was quite exciting looking back on it. Um, but we, what we ended up with was a, a great uh, outline of the actions and strategies that we want to implement looking forward. So if you're interested in reading it, it's um, available on our website. There is a full plan here that is uh, maybe 100 pages long, but it includes a lot of background information, a lot of sort of historic data, um, as well as the sort of salient points of what are the actions and goals that we are setting out for ourselves in the next five years. If you just want to look at what are the actions and goals, then go to the strategy summary. It gets right to the point as far as what are the top actions that we're trying to accomplish here in the state. So the blueprint um, is sort of broken into four major sections of protection goals, restoration goals, harvest goals, and education goals. And we don't need to worry too much about the way that this is. This is more of a structural way that the blueprint is, is set up if you're reading it, but you don't need to worry too much about it other than just, I guess, having that background information that we did try to think about binning these actions and, and goals. And there's a number of partners and collaborators that have been involved in this. So every time I put this slide together, including earlier this week, I get to add additional logos to this, this presentation because we continue to have more and more people coming into the fold and helping to participate in these, these actions and, and goals that we've laid out. And everybody brings you know, a different skill to the table when we get together, but there's a lot of, a lot of brilliant minds that come together and, and make this work possible. So the first goal that I'm going to talk about is water quality. So not only do oysters help improve water quality, but they also need good water quality so that they can be safely harvested um, and, and survive themselves. So we track water quality trends in the state, and we've also set out some goals for restoring and protecting water quality. And so we've identified two water bodies, the Newport River and Stump Sound, as being very important coastal water bodies for shell fishing. They have a lot of wild oyster resources. They also have a lot of oyster farms that are existing in them. And they're showing signs of water quality degradation. So over time, the water quality trend is not going in the direction that we want. So we've, we're working to create watershed restoration plans for those two water bodies. And then we're also looking at the rest of the watersheds in North Carolina and saying, OK, where are the other areas of the state that we need to be prioritizing and working to improve water quality? So I'm going to walk you through this map here on the left. This is the Newport River. And what I want you to see is that um, you know, these are the, the tributaries feeding into the main Newport River. Any area that is shown in dark blue is an area that is considered closed to harvest. So the bacteria levels are too high for oysters to be safely harvested in those sections of the river. These other areas that have um, more of a, a grayish blue um, color to them, these are areas where at certain levels of rain, those water bodies are closed. So the darker blue has a, has a one and a half inch trigger, I believe, after an inch and a half of rain, they have to close that water body. And I, I'm pretty sure it's a two inch rainfall that closes this lighter blue area. 
What we're seeing, though, is that closure line is moving. So we're getting more areas turning dark blue. We're getting this gray, darker gray area moving more and more out into the main river body, and we're getting this closure line moving down out into the mouth. So that's not the trend that we want to be seeing. There are a number of um, oyster farms that are right here, and if you're an oyster farmer, you need to be able to harvest your product. Right? So you need water quality to be reliably good for you. And in general, in North Carolina, we have good water quality. We are, in general, we have 70% of our waters are open to harvest. So that means that they are safe enough year-round to be harvested. But what we're seeing is this, this concerning trend of temporary closures and more permanent closures over time. And that's what we're trying, trying to stop. So the Stump Sound and Newport River watershed restoration plans, those have both been drafted and they're out for review right now. And so we're moving on to looking at other water bodies up and down the coast. And this is, um, we've worked with the state shellfish sanitation and, and researchers at NC State to prioritize these additional 10 water bodies that are also going to need some additional um, protection and restoration plans being drafted for them moving forward. So up here in the northern part of the state, oops, I hit the wrong button. We've got um, this area in uh, Rose Bay um, off of Hyde County and then the, the Bay River as priorities. So the next couple of actions that we're gonna go through, I, I need to stop and give you a little bit of a primer before we, we get too far into them. And I apologize in advance for um, some of the jargon that we use in this world. I'm going to try to explain it so that you're prepared as we go through these next slides. But the next couple of strategies or next couple of things that we're going to talk about are related to restoring our oyster populations. And so the way we restore our oyster populations in North Carolina is by putting material in the water. And then we allow natural oyster larvae to attract to it. And how and why does that work? Well, this is the oyster life cycle. And you can see here um, at the bottom of the image, you have um, your adult oysters. So this is as if you had a you know, wild oyster reef. Um, at certain times of the year, the oysters will broadcast spawn, which means they release their eggs and sperm into the water. And then by magic, they find each other and fertilize. Um, you have then this fertilized egg that goes through a couple different stages, a couple different larval stages. And during this time frame from fertilized egg to when they come, become a pedivelager and, and want to settle, the, this, these stages um, is the only time in their life that they are mobile. So they're able to swim. They're called free swimming larvae, but they don't really swim. They can maybe go up or down in the water column, but they're not like, oh, hey, I'm going over here a mile away. No, they're like able to go a little bit up or a little bit down in the water column, but this is the only time in, in their lives, though, that they are, are mobile. And they are you know, at the discretion of the tides and the, and the currents um, and the wind patterns. But then, at su and this is about a two-week time span that they are um, in these larval stages. And then they get some sort of environmental cue that says it's time for them to land. They need to find their permanent home. And so they quite literally create a little phototrophic eye and a little foot that they use to find the right spot to, to settle. So the eye helps them decide whether they're going away from or towards the light, and the foot is like their tongue. They're like feeling out, where's a good spot for me to land? And in general, they like to land on other oyster reefs or on other oyster shells, right? And this makes sense because we want them to be aggregating. They want to be close so that when it comes time to, to breed again, their eggs and, larvae and um, sperm can find each other and continue this process. So they land, and they basically cement themselves in place, and they never move again. And they just take nutrients out of the water, and that is what allows them to build their shell and, and grow. So just like a tree ring or what have you, they will um, show signs of growth and, and growth rings as they, they uh, mature over time. Yeah? Uh, I mean, it's, a, it's like a, it would be a plankton, so it's, it's soft. You can kind of see, I mean, it, when you look at it under a microscope, it looks like a clam, like a little baby clam. Um, I, don't, I wouldn't call it a hard shell. I'm sure it's some sort of calcium carbonate, but it's not like mature. once, yeah, it's not mature like when, you, when it lands on the, on the adult oysters to grow up. Mm -hmm. 
Any other questions about this life cycle before we move on? Okay, so this is important though because in the state of North Carolina, we still have enough adult oysters in the water that if we put material in the water, it will attract the baby oysters, they will come. There are some states where their oyster population is so depressed that they have to not only put material in the water, but they also have to put the babies. So they have to go to a lab where the oysters are artificially you know, spawned and then take those larvae and put them onto the reef itself. So this cuts down on quite a, a lot of um, expense by allowing us to, to use the natural spat that are in the, um, in the water. So then the next thing I have to explain is that there's sort of four different main ways that we are growing oysters in the state, and they all have different purposes. And so understanding the different purposes is important to, not, to then knowing sort of what our goals are moving forward. So we have oyster sanctuaries, and these are large oyster reefs that are being built in the sound. They are not open to harvest. Their only purpose is, to cre is basically to be an insurance policy for our oyster population. Um, they're broodstock sanctuaries, which means that they're protected from harvest so that they can simply create brood, reproduce, and send their baby oysters out into the great wide sound. Um, living shorelines is another technique where we're not harvesting, or we're hopefully not harvesting, off of these structures. These are um, structures that are put in the water, and you can see they're kind of like speed bumps in the water. And the idea is that they're breaking down wave energy so that the shoreline and marsh behind them can, can be protected from erosion. Um, where you have good oyster growing waters, these living shorelines create beautiful oyster reefs. So this is a strategy that we have for, for creating more oysters in the sound. On the opposite side of the spectrum, we have culch planting, which is, um, pl again, placing material in the water. Culch refers to any material that we put in the water that is designed to attract baby oysters. So it could be oyster shell, it could be marl, it could be granite, it could be concrete, it could be a number of different materials. But we collectively call that culch, and we call it culch planting when we put that material into the water with the purpose of growing a new oyster reef for harvest. And then the third, or sorry, the fourth way that we're growing oysters is in off oyster farms, also known as oyster aquaculture. And so oyster farms are, are being managed by individuals, and they're growing oysters in bags or cages or sometimes putting it on the bottom of the sound. But these are four different ways that we are, are growing oysters, and we have different goals associated with each one of these strategies that I'm going to go into a little more detail on. Any questions before we move on? Okay. Um, so in all of those, we're trying to go basically from oyster shell or our culch material to a live oyster reef. So this is what it would look like. We're, we're collecting shell here, and then we're putting it in the sound in strategic places and having oysters attract to and grow up on those, those reef structures. So oyster sanctuaries, these are the large oyster sanctuaries in the sound that are not available for harvest. Um, their, their purpose is to act as broodstock for our oyster population or an insurance policy. So we'd set a goal of building 500 acres of oyster sanctuary by 2020. Well, we got pretty close. We got to about 380, but we haven't quite crossed that finish line to 500. So our goal in the current edition of the blueprint is to build that last 100 acres of oyster sanctuary and get to our 500 acre goal. We don't have any protected reefs. We don't have any oyster sanctuaries in the southern part of the state because the water is, is different, but um, it's not as deep as Pamlico Sound. The water bodies are a little bit more narrow. So we don't have a protected reef designation in our southern waters. And so one of our questions is, should we? And if we do, what does that look like in the southern part of the state? And then we also want to know, OK, once we get to that 500-acre goal, is that enough? Or do we need to build more oyster reefs? So those are the sort of questions and things that we're trying to answer in this current edition of the blueprint. So this is where our oyster sanctuaries are in Pamlico Sound. Um, as I said, there's about 389 acres that have been built, um, covering 566 
permitted acres. So that means we, are, we have permission to build 566 acres, but so far we've only done 389. And you can see they're pretty well scattered along the, the shoreline here and you know, concentrated in the areas where we were seeing some historic oyster reefs back in the 1900s. We received a grant to build two new oyster sanctuaries in partnership with the Division of Marine Fisheries. Um, and with this grant, we will, have, we will achieve that 500 acre goal and we will have up to eight, almost 800 acres that are permitted. So we could do some additional work on them in the future. So pretty excited about these oyster sanctuaries. And this, this is where I spend a lot of my time is working on oyster sanctuaries and, and the funding for them. Um, Oh, and these are where they're going to be. So they're going to be in that sort of southeast, or I'm sorry, southwest corner of Pamlico Sound. <clears throat> so I want to tell you a little bit more about how awesome oyster sanctuaries are and how great they're doing. So they only make up 8% of all of the reefs in the sound, but on those reefs, we have 33% of the population. So they're basically like the concentrated cities of oysters in Pamlico Sound. And then off of those, because they're not harvested, we tend to have larger oysters that live on them, which means more adults. More adults are making more babies. And so they're responsible for 75% of all of the larvae in the sound. So 8% of the reef area, 33% of the population, 75% of the baby production. So they're pretty important uh, for our, our population. And then this is just a really interesting picture of the three different types of reefs that we have. So the sanctuary reef, you can see we have a lot of adult oysters here on them, um, a lot of diversity of, of sizes as well, some smaller oysters. On the culch planted reefs, they also have adult oysters, but it's not forming that same sort of reef structure. And then in our natural reefs, what we mean by natural is places that aren't managed. They're not going out and actively managing them. Um, you can see quite a bit less oyster reef happening. And in actuality, what your eyes are telling you is what's happening. Our oyster densities on the sanctuaries are eight times higher than the culture planted reefs and 72 times higher than those natural reefs. So the oyster sanctuaries are really important to our Pamlico Sound oyster population. The next one that we're going to talk about is our living shorelines. Um, so again, these are the speed bumps that are helping to provide some shoreline erosion protection and they're also great oyster habitat. So we, in our current edition of the Blueprint, we wanted to expand the use of living shorelines. We wanted to create three miles of living shorelines and by 2025, and we wanted to ensure that these, these reefs are not able to be harvested. Because um, right now, if they're built in um, waters that are open, right, there's no closure on them, you could technically, there's, no, there's nothing saying that they can't be harvested. So we want to limit that harvest because they're going in the water for the shoreline protection and the habitat that they're being created for. So already we're halfway into the blueprint. We've created f almost four and a half miles. So our goal was three miles. We've already built four and a half and we have a lot of work ahead of us in these next two years. So we're going to probably double or even triple this, this goal, which is pretty exciting. The next is our recycling for reefs. I've got a couple of shell recyclers here in the room. You can raise your hand if you want to. Um, but the goal here is to recycle oyster shell to use in those culch planting activities. And so this is our interlude between the, the sanctuary and living shorelines and the aquaculture and culch planting. So what we're doing here, and this was during the pandemic, so um, Bill Tremere is our volunteer photographed here, and he's wearing a mask for protection, but um, he was going around to our local restaurants collecting oyster shells and helping to bring them down to Wanchi's where we stockpile them and then use them in restoration activities. So the, the state had a shell recycling program that was funded until 2015, but the, the program was um, sunset. And so then they limped along with some grants until about 2018. And we've been trying to pick up the pieces to create a more comprehensive shell recycling strategy ever since then. And so our goal in this edition of the Blueprint is to be able to recycle 5% of the shell that's needed for our restoration activities by 2025, and then to identify some priority locations for where that shell should go. <coughs> where are we so far? 
Well, we have expanded our shell collection efforts coastwide. We now have 30 public drop-off locations all along the coast. Um, that's nine new sites that have been added in the past three years. And we've also been increasing the volume of shell that's collected. So this is pretty exciting. 2021, we collected about 3,500 bushels of oyster shell. 2022, we were up to 7,500, so we almost doubled it, or more than doubled it. And 2023, we were up to 9,400 bushels. So we're continuing to increase the number of, the amount of shell that is, is being collected. And so I'm hopeful that by you know, 2025, we'll, we'll be at that 15,000 bushel goal. And then with that, so far, we've built four acres of new habitat um, using, um, using shell from these recycling efforts to, to build these reefs. And this is an image of um, some volunteers working with our partners at the Nature Conservancy to, to build a reef back um, down here on the Outer Banks. So then cultch planting, this is where we're putting that cultch material in the water for our wild harvest. And you can see this is um, the Division of Marine Fisheries, and they are quite literally using a fire hose to just wash the shell off of the deck into the sound. Um, the area that they're washing it into has been permitted, and they've done some you know, investigation to make sure it's a good spot and it's going to grow oysters. Um, but they, I mean, that's as sophisticated as it gets. They're just washing it off the deck into the right location. Um, and so our goal here is to build 40 acres of those harvestable reefs annually and to study the program that we're using to see, is there a way to do this more efficiently? Can we grow more oysters at a cheaper cost for, um, for these management purposes? And so the progress that we've been making so far is that, yes, we are building these oyster um, cult reefs. In 2021, we built 48 acres, 2022, 37. 2023, we only built 13. Um, and a lot of that had to do with some equipment that we were in, or that we, I say we, I mean the collective we of the oyster blueprint. This was the Division of Marine Fisheries that was um, making this purchase. But they acquired a new barge here. You can see this is the RV Oyster Creek. And um, it's a larger barge than their other equipment. It can hold, I think they said six times more material than any of their other barges. So the idea is that this barge will hold more material. It'll go out into the sound, and then the smaller barges will be able to come, get material from it, and go to build the reefs. And so that is you know, hopefully makes it more efficient. They won't have to, those smaller barges won't have to come into port to get material as often. They'll be able to go to the mother barge and um, get the material that they need. So then shellfish aquaculture is a growing, um, a growing interest in the state of North Carolina. We've seen a lot of interest in the last decade um, for, for new oyster farms. Um, we set a goal through a strategic planning effort that was just specific to the oyster um, aquaculture industry that we wanted to grow the, the industry to $100 million by 2030. And so our interim goal here is to get to 45 million by, by 2025. And then we want to be able to provide education and outreach um, and support for our new and existing oyster growers. And, um, and then we're also working to advance the oyster trail. And this is an ecotourism effort um, where we're trying to encourage people to come visit oyster farms and support North Carolina oyster growers by eating oyster, asking for and eating North Carolina oysters at restaurants. Um, we also have some aquariums and museums and the Coastal Federation offices are on the oyster trail so you can come and learn about oysters. And so what have we done to advance this goal? Um, currently the industry is valued at about 14.6 million. And um, we have recently secured funding for an oyster aquaculture hub. What is an oyster aquaculture hub? I'm glad you asked. It is a facility that will um, support oyster growers who don't have waterfront property themselves. So the idea is that it's kind of like a co-op where oyster growers can come and they will have waterfront access. They can tie up their boats there. Um, they can store their gear on site. There will also be refrigeration for them so that when they bring their harvest in, they can refrigerate their product before it is distributed. So that is coming online. We've um, got a number of grants that are in place now. Um, and so we're working to finalize all of the plans for that facility, and that'll be in Carteret County. And the county itself donated the land to the, the, proper, to the project. So 
Um, so it's pretty neat to have that be moving forward. The Oyster Trail, like I said, this is an ecotourism effort. Um, Bill Husted, I'd be remiss if I didn't shout you out. Bill is responsible for the success of the Oyster Trail almost single-handedly. And um, we started, we launched the Oyster Trail in 2020 um, during the pandemic. And so far, we've grown it to include 80 sites statewide. It goes all the way from, you know, Manio to Kalawi. And in 2023 alone, we had 17,000 visitors come to the NC Oyster Trail website. Um, Eight million people were reached with the various uh, promotional news coverage that we had from print media to social media, ads, um, newspaper articles, et cetera. And then every October, since we've launched the Oyster Trail, we've hosted an NC Oyster Week. This year, we host, hosted an NC Oyster Month, and we had um, 30 events held during the month of October that were in support of and encouraging visitors to, to support the NC Oyster Trail. So if you haven't visited the Oyster Trail, I encourage you to, to look it up and, and plan your next adventure. And then, of course, outreach and education is fundamental to all of the Oyster Blueprint stuff. We have to make sure people know about what's happening. We have to engage and build new partnerships. And so what we do, um, or what our goals are for this edition of the Blueprint, is to continue engaging through our, our statewide network of Oyster Steering Committee members, um, and to also be working directly with our museums and aquariums and other institutions that are, are outreach and engagement sort of vehicles, and then expanding the use of our traditional um, and social media outlets. So what does that look like? Well, we have funding in place, and we've been working with the North Carolina Aquarium on Roanoke Island to, to, uh, to create a new exhibit. Um, I started talking to, to Larry about this several years ago, and at first we were thinking, like, let's at least have a poster that you know, is going to talk about oysters in the aquarium. And he said, well, let's not just stop there. Let's do a whole new wing. So we have like a whole new wing coming to the aquarium on Roanoke Island um, starting this fall. So keep your eye out. We should be um, launching at least two of the four uh, exhibits this year. Um, through that NOAA Oyster Sanctuary grant that I was telling you about, that we got the, the $15 million to expand our sanctuary efforts, we're also able to work with our partners at NC State and NC Central and they are hiring eight graduate students um, as a cohort over the next three years to go through their programs, um, either as master's or PhD students. And um, we're targeting uh, working with underserved community members and um, looking to give them you know, their master's and PhD focus working on oyster sanctuaries. So pretty excited to, to have that program coming online. And then also um, Rachel Bassesi, who is our educator in the Southeast or Central Office, is working um, pretty heavily with NC Central to, to also provide experiences for their undergraduates. So they come to the coast several times a year and have some hands-on experiences. We have a lot that's happening in oyster education and outreach, so I can't touch on all of it, but these are sort of three new um, programs that we're, we're excited to be launching this, this year. So every year, we publish a State of the Oyster report where we report on all of this progress. What you guys got to hear was a little bit of a primer on the 2023 State of the Oyster report. So Victoria and I are, are working on um, drafting that report and getting it finalized. But right now, if you're interested, you're welcome to check out the 2022 report, which is on our website. Um, and the 23 report will be coming out, hopefully, in the next couple of months. And then with that, I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Silly question. Can clamshells be used as pouch also? Mm -hmm. Can we repeat the question? Oh, yes. The question was, can clamshells be used as culch material as well? And the answer is yes. Uh -huh. Is there any... Is there any... Um, effort being made to stop the pollution coming from those uh, tributaries that are emptying into the Pamlico Channel and other places? Yes, there are a number of efforts underway. So those watershed restoration plans that I was telling you about, those are really comprehensive plans to um, 
to look at both land-based practices as well as in-water practices that could be used to help, if nothing else, stop that further degradation from happening and hopefully reverse the trend. So um, those are watershed restoration plans are um, a pretty hefty lift working with you know, the local government, municipalities, um, land, landowners and partners, and it identifies in very stepwise fashion, what is causing the impairment currently, where are our sources of pollution, and what steps can we take in order to you know, stymie it and, and reverse the trend. Um, so both the Newport River and the Stump Sound watershed restoration plans are in various stages of being implemented now. Yeah, great question. A question in the back. Um, what would happen if oysters are harvested in not good water quality? What would happen if oysters were harvested? What do you, can you elaborate on, like? Yes. Um, when you said that oysters have to be harvested in good water conditions, uh -huh. what would happen if someone harvested them in bad water conditions? So the concern is that there would be bacteria that would cause harm to humans. Um, so the concern is that you would eat an oyster that would make you sick. Um, and so that's why we, we don't harvest. And we have the EPA and, and North Carolina have very strict standards on water quality. Um, it's 14 coliform forming units per, um, per milliliter. But it's basically it's the, the bar is set very low. One bird pooping in the right place at the right time can create a spike of like 4,000 fecal coliform forming units. So 14 is, is you're, you want like no bacteria at all basically in the water. And so when the state is testing our waters, um, if they get a trigger above that, then they close the water body. Yeah, so the concern is human health mostly. Mm -hmm. Bill. Do you know the source and type of pollution that's causing the issues at this point? Um, so the conventional wisdom has been that it's modifications to the landscape, that it's just stormwater coming from um, across the landscape that's now being channelized because of all the modifications that we've made to our coast um, and entering the, the sound. Um, I think there's more research that's maybe needed to, to be able to say specifically and, and concretely it is coming from exactly this source. But in general, the conventional wisdom has been that it is coming from or stormwater runoff. Mm -hmm. Yes, John. Have there been any document, documented studies to document the improvement in the water quality near the, the larger oyster reefs, the sanctuaries? to be able to show that the water quality is improving there. Um, we have monitoring, it's, it's not really long-term monitoring that's being done on the sanctuaries. It's mostly like for a discrete period of time, either during the reef building activities or right after the reef building activities. So I don't know that, that we could attribute the sanctuaries to any kind of universal water quality improvement. That, that's not, yeah, that data doesn't exist currently. How, how deep can the oyster oyster reefs grow? I see, you know, the one that's out here, you know, you can see the top of it, but some of those look like they're quite deep. Yeah, so the sanctuaries are subtidal, and um, they're, they're built in water that's about 14 feet deep. Um, and really it's about, from what I understand, it's about them getting enough food and not being in low DO water. So they need to be elevated enough, uh, low dissolved oxygen. So they need to be up off the water um, or off, off the sediment bed enough that they're in the water column where they're getting enough food, so enough plankton is passing them, um, and they're also not in, in low oxygen because that'll, that'll cause them to die. Yeah. Great questions. Uh-huh. <laughs> Um, how long does a oyster live, and um, how frequently do they reproduce or produce larvae? Yeah, so they can live a long time. Um, I don't think we humans let them live as long as they could possibly live, right? So from my understanding, they can live more than 30 years. 
um, maybe even 50 years. I mean, you can, you'll find some, some pretty large oysters. Um, and then your, the other part of your question was how often do they reproduce? So, again, my understanding is that they typically will start reproducing, they'll have a couple spawns a year. Um, typically they reproduce when the water starts warming up in the spring, like when it hits about 55 degrees. Um, and then they can also spawn, like we've seen a lot of spawning happen after storm events. So it's sort of like, oh my gosh, we just got hit by a storm. We got to make sure the babies are going to make it next season. So we'll see some spikes sometimes in the fall after, like after Florence, they saw a big spike in um, larval productivity and spat settlement. So at least once or twice a year. Okay. Any other questions? Um, when you said that we are collecting more oyster shells now, does that mean that more oysters are dying? Or are you guys just having better um, processes to like collect them? Yeah, um, we are having better processes in collecting them. So we have... Um, and I should let Victoria talk about it, but Victoria heads up our oyster shell recycling program for the Outer Banks, and we have 11 restaurants now that we're working with here, um, and then we have a great team of volunteers that go and collect the shell from those restaurants and bring it back to the stockpile. So um, a few years ago, we were only working with, um, I think, four restaurants. So every year we're, we're adding new restaurants on. And then, um, and that's just here in the Outer Banks. In the central part of the coast, we have a great partnership with the, the counties. They allow us, um, they've provided us with some dumpsters that they keep on site and um, at their transfer stations and the public can go and bring their shell to those transfer stations. And then when the shell fills the dumpster, then they bring it to us to use. So that's a new partnership that's just come online and we've been able to put um, four new dumpsters in place. And then in the southern part of the state, we have a, a, a great partner, Ghost Fleet Oyster Company, who is an oyster grower, but then they also are providing shell recycling services to the restaurants that they service. So they'll sell their, oy their live oysters, and then once the oysters are consumed, they go back and get the shell from those restaurants and recycle it. And then in the um, Triangle area in Raleigh, the native shorelines, um, they service four restaurants in the Triangle area, and they, they're producing almost half the volume of shell is, is coming from those four restaurants in Raleigh. So, yeah. So we're just getting better at getting it. <laughs> Last call for questions. All right, well, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Aaron, thank you so much for coming out tonight, and we hope that we'll see you all at our events in April.